to what my lab is focused on and what our research goals are. Um, so obviously cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in the United States. As you can see from this nice little heat map here where the areas with the dark red are obviously the areas that are highly, uh, have highly prevalence of cardiovascular disease. Um, for our lab, we mainly focus on after a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. And so approximately every 40 seconds, an American will have a heart attack. And the average age spans um, usually in the older population with uh, 65 years being in men and 72 years uh, in women. And um, I like that stat because we are one of the other focuses of our lab is to look at why women are protected earlier in their life um, from myocardial infarctions. Um, so obviously after, ha after AMI, you have the wound healing response where the initial phase is the inflammatory phase. You have recruitment of neutrophils, macrophages, high cytokine activation, um, this transitions into the proliferation phase where we begin to infiltrate fibroblasts and they become active and they start that whole wound healing process. You then enter into the maturation phase. This is where the scar is being, has been or is continuously being laid down and that remodeling process is occurring. And this is the uh, timeline that has been shown in animal models of MI. And we want to know what portions are, are there many portions that are beneficial and how can we uh, gauge this and alter this so that we can basically decrease heart failure after a heart attack. And so in my lab, we are mainly focusing on the CD8 positive T cells. We know that they're present in the heart. In a study in 2013 in JMCC, they found after permanent occlusion, the CD8 T cells increase at day one post-MI and can and last as long as 14 days post-MI. Actually, and in a study uh, published a couple of years later, um, they actually found CD8 T cells are still remain within the infarct eight weeks after permanent occlusion in a mouse model. So they're there, but we don't really understand what they're doing because CD8 T cells are mainly known for the role in viral protection. So what are they doing in what we would consider a non-viral environment um, after an infarct? What is their role in this process? So we use a CD8 T cell uh, deficient animal. Basically, there's a targeted mutation on the CD8 receptor so that it does not get traffic to the surface of the cell. This basically means that there are no CD8 T cells that can become activated. They do not exist. Um, and using this model, we found that with uh, in animals that were deficient of CD8 T cells, they actually did have improved seven day survival after myocardial infarction, or about more than 80% lived into day seven. And in our wild type, we usually get about 50 to 60 can live till day seven post of mine. We also looked at cardiac function by echocardiography, and again, in our knockout animals, there was an improvement in both ejection fraction and fractional shortening. So these animals seem to be protected when there's not CD8 T, cell animal, uh, CD8 T cells within the infarct areas. We then went to look at that whole inflammatory phase, and we focused mainly at day three post-MI and found that uh, with the MI, we do have an infiltration of, of T cells, which we know. And uh, as a confirmation, there was no CD positive T cells either in the infarct or in the remote area, which is abbreviated here as LVC, um, which was a good, a good thing to note that there wasn't any in our, in our knockout animals. We also looked at the CD4. We wanted to see if deletion of the CD8s were causing an amplification of the CD4 cells, and it was. Um, and majority of them were actually the Th1 or the pro-inflammatory cells. So there was an alteration in the other T cell populations um, when you have no CD8 T cells uh, present in the infarct. We also then want to look at the other uh, immune cells like our macrophages or neutrophils. Um, these tend to be the big players. They come in very robustly. T cells don't, aren't present in large numbers within the infarct. However, multiple studies have shown that the T cells are regulating some of the, the bigger players like neutrophils and macrophages. So looking at F480 as a marker for macrophages, we did find that there uh, was no differences between our wild type RCD T cell deficient animals. We also looked at Lysic-C high population um, this is a marker for more of the monocyte derived uh, macrophages. And again, there was no significant differences between our genotypes. 
Um, we also then looked at M2, which is our, our uh, you know, anti-inflammatory uh, cell populations, and again, no difference. However, we did find an increase in our Lysix-G positive cells, which is mainly our uh, neutrophil population. Um, it was also interesting is that more recently, we have found that neutrophils can also polarize. And in a study that was uh, published, I think it was back in 2016, we found that within the heart, there is a um, a increase in the N2, or what we're calling the anti-inflammatory neutrophils, um, slowly over the time course post of my. What was interesting though was we had more N2s in the remote compared to the to the uh, infarct area, both in the wild type, and this was actually decreased in our CD8 T cell deficient animals. So somehow the CD8 T cells are altering mainly the neutrophil population. Um, and that this may be facilitating in uh, some of the wound healing uh, processes that we're seeing. We also looked at fibrosis. Obviously, after the inflammatory phase, you want to be able to lay down a collagen scar. Um, we looked at picoserious red staining shown at the top and found that in our CD8 T cell deficient animals, there was actually an acceleration in collagen deposition starting as early as day three, but by day seven, there was no significant difference. We also confirmed this by Western blot, uh, as you can see from the bottom panel. And again, there was an amplification um, at starting at day three in our CD8 T cell knockouts, both at the 250 and the 130 kilodalton band. Um, so there seems to be a, a acceleration as far as the timeline is concerned um, with the, fi with the uh, fibrosis or the collagen deposition within our infarcts. So collagen not only does it have to be deposited into the infarct, it has to be formed into the fibrils and has to be cross-linked in order to form a very stable scar. Obviously, the more cross-linking, the more stiff it will be. So we wanted to look to see if there was changes in the uh, collagen cross-linking, and we looked at one of the enzymes enzymes lysol oxidase by Western blot. We found that at the pro form, so that's a 50 kiloton band, there was no differences between genotypes. However, um, the active form was actually slightly decreased in our CD8 T cell knockout animals. So that's suggesting that there's less collagen cross-linking. Um, this may be actually facilitating with the improved cardiac function. Obviously, if the scar is not stiff, that's actually going to be beneficial um, so that the, the heart is more compliant. Um, but this needs to be looked at a little bit more in detail. So just to kind of summarize what we know so far, we believe that the CD8 T cells are both beneficial and detrimental. Uh, we think that their uh, response is likely uh, both temporal uh, different, it's temporally different, different. In fact, that it may be beneficial to have CD8 T cells early post MI, but as you start transitioning into that whole cardiac remodeling process, having them for a long time would possibly be detrimental. Um, our study seems to suggest that CD8 T cells are activating macrophages. We did find an increase in MRTK expression in our hearts. Um, obviously, a macrophage that is highly phagocytic is going to be removing all that necrotic debris. This can actually facilitate in uh, decreasing uh, the inflammatory response because you can start decreasing that whole uh, process to um, pro-inflammatory response. Um, in the same, at the same time, CD8 T cells have also been shown to be uh, to target healthy myocytes after uh, cardiac antigen activation. So whether or not they have that detrimental portion is where we're actually trying to kind of focus our attention. Is it a both that they can do both, or is it more a the lack of them was causing some uh, some detrimental effects? So I want to uh, go into the permanent occlusion model. This is uh, one of the models that are used to evaluate um, ischemic injury and the whole development of heart failure. Um, so I wanted to introduce our model first before we start talking about EKGs. And so this is actually from a book chapter that was published in 2013. Um, this is uh, what we call a fairly, in, um, not as invasive as some of the other models because we tried to do as little injury to the animal as possible. Um, so first, after intubation, we incise, uh, we make an incision and identify the muscle layers that are covering the rib cage. We then retract those muscle layers to visually locate the third and fourth rib. And then you can see, actually see it in this picture, you can see the third and fourth rib. So this is where we want to enter. Obviously, if you go too low, you won't be able to see anything but maybe the apex. If you go too high, you'll be seeing mainly the uh, atrium. 
And so we want to get, get between that third and fourth rib. We then position a piece of gauze. So we make a small incision just to put the gauze inside. Obviously, when we open up that intercostal uh, space, you're going to visually, you're going to see the, the lungs. And we don't want to cause injury to anything outside of the LAD. And so we want to be able to protect those lungs. So we put in a piece of gauze to basically um, move and cover the lungs so that we can start opening up the chest. Once you have the gauze in place, you can actually see it in this image. Um, it's, it's basically blocking the lungs from getting into your field of vision. Um, you can visually see the LAD. You're going to ligate that LAD um, and look for visual changes in the heart, including blanching and uh, lack of movement within the apex. Once you have um, everything uh, ligated and you confirm L, um, that you have an MI, you then want to reposition the muscle layers. Basically, we want to put everything back where you found it. So like I said, we want to be as uh, make as minimal damage to the animal as we can. So we try to make sure that everything goes back exactly like we had it before we opened up the chest. We then suture the skin. Um, obviously, this is, image shows that we cut the neck in order to visualize the uh, trachea to intubate the animal as well as uh, closing up that chest incision. So Sam, I'm gonna bring it back to you for another audience poll. Yes, thank you, Christine. Um, just to give you a quick break, um, I will launch the next audience poll. Uh, what is your role in the lab? Um, are you perhaps a PhD student, uh, postdoc student, uh, MSC, uh, PI, research associate, a clinician, uh, MD, um, or are you other? Um, perhaps you're here just for scientific curiosity. Um, this lets us know uh, who our audience is and for future presentations, we can, um, we can make sure that we have topics that are relevant. I'll give you guys about 10 more seconds to, to choose an answer and uh, we'll move on. See the majority of, uh, of our attendees are postdocs and PIs and some research associates. Okay. Well, thank you guys. And uh, I'll bring Christine back to continue her presentation. All right. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little about using the EKG to confirm a successful MI. So obviously I mentioned that one way to, uh, to confirm that you have a good MI is to look at visual changes. Um, as you can see from this picture, the heart or the LV is white in color, so it's, um, it's not that normal uh, pinkish red color. Um, that's one of the biggest ways that you can tell that you have an MI is looking at LV blanching. You can also look at the lack of movement within the left ventricle. After ligation, the left ventricle should not really move anymore um, due to the lack of blood supply to the muscle. Another way you can actually confirm is the atria tends to actually start pumping very, very quickly, um, trying to compensate for that lack of movement in the left ventricle. So these are ways that you can visually confirm MI. However, there are some issues with that. So obviously for our lab, we like to look at 35% infarct as a cutoff um, for a a good MI. And we don't want to have anything too large either. So we look between 35 to 55% infarct as our range where we want to be within. Um, however, just looking visually, a lot of times you have lots of variation in the infarct size. In addition, the LAD is it branches, right? So you have to make sure that you uh, like it high enough that you're um, getting all of the blood supply and not just one of the branches. Otherwise, you'll get just a small local infarct. We also find that there are anatomical differences between animals, and we find a lot actually between the male and the female mice. Um, and so this can, you know, cause some issues as far as like, do you know that you actually received, got the LAD and that you did give it a good MI? And about 50% of the, uh, the time, you don't actually see the LAD clearly. And there are a lot of, a lot of different techniques as far as being able to see the LAD a little bit better if it's um, kind of hidden. Um, but if you aren't actually being able to see the LAD clearly, obviously you have to kind of guess it, it, you know, where the area is. Um, so this obviously can cause some, some issues as far as when you're trying to get a, a good infarct that is the right size and um, not too small and definitely not too big. 
And so obviously after the MI is given, um, you can eat uh, staying with uh, tetrazodium chloride or triphenyl tetrazodium chloride, um, RTTC. And this is one thing that we do at tissue collection. You can stain uh, where the viable tissue is stained red and the uh, infarct is obviously that white color. And as you can see from that last study, um, we had quite a large range of infarct sizes. Um, some of our animals had very, very large infarcts, and this was uh, you know, a little bit a detriment when it comes to survival studies. Um, luckily, we focused mainly on day three, so it wasn't as big of an issue. But we really want to kind of decrease that variation because you can have differences between groups by accident just for the sheer, sheer fact that there was differences in the infarct size. And we really want to also improve survival. So we're trying ways to improve our surgeries so that we can, every single time we open the chest, ensure that we have a good MI and that it is, um, you know, we're not going to lose animals just for the sheer fact that the infarct wasn't large enough. And so obviously using AKG, EKGs has been used clinically to, to uh, show that a patient has an MI. Um, and we mainly look for that ST segment elevation. As you can see from the uh, pictures on the right, the uh, first is pre-ligation and the second is after ligation. You can, uh, you can see that there is that ST segment um, increase. Um, and there's been some studies, mainly uh, the example I have is from 2010. This was actually a ischemia reperfusion model, and they did find that they could predict severity of MI damage um, based on the ST high elevation as also the QTC prolongation, so the time from Q, um, QTC. Um, and so we wanted to kind of come up with a way to, uh, in, our, in, in our hands, that we could actually confirm the MI and try to get those infarct sizes a, little, a lot more consistent. And I find that with er as early career, this seems to be difficult because you do have high turnover and we want all of our animals to do well. Um, so this is a picture of our setup, and as you can see from this animal, this is after ligation. Our animals are laid down with their uh, paws on the electrodes um, with some gel on the paws. Um, we can measure it during the whole surgical process, so not only are we measuring things like heart rate, we're also me measuring, um, we can measure uh, O2 um, num um, values, we can also measure body temperature, um, and we can kind of maintain our animals so that we're know that they are doing okay throughout the surgery. And so more recently, because I am trying to get our surgeons a lot more consistent, we started looking at things like the QRST area changes. So basically, we're looking at the area under the curve when we go from QRS to the ST segment. And as you can see, versus pre, pre to post, you can easily tell that there's a significant increase in the area under the curve. Um, and the, on the right is actually a picture of one of our uh, animals um, where we're, I'm trying to show you where we're trying to look at as far as what area is the area under the curve, um, which we show here in the reddish color. We also wanted to look at um, changes in ST elevation. So we basically put our markers at R to S um, and obviously from R to S, there's a significant decrease in, um, in the millivolts um, on, under normal conditions. With that ST elevation, there's less of a decrease. So we use those um, to kind of see if, there, if there's any changes or there is changes um, after the, um, the MI. So you can see here, this is a, basically a quantification of that ST elevation. And again, pre versus post, they are significantly different. But we wanted to do more than just say, okay, yes, pre versus post, there's differences. We want to say, is there a optimal number that we can reach um, that tells us that, yes, we definitely have a good MI. Um, and so this is a small cohort. We're really trying to increase the, these numbers. Um, where we looked at animals that had a, a good MI based on TTC staining and echo versus the animals that did not have a good MI. So there was lots of movement in the apex or the apex was not infarcted and it was more of a local injury. Um, and as you can see, it, uh, there was a trend in that this is a measurement of the pre minus the post. So this is the 
differences between pre versus post in that RS interval. Um, and there is a trend that when you give a large MI, you are going to see a bigger change in that RS interval versus if you don't give a good MI. We also did a, a rock area under the curve analysis. And again, there does seem to be a, a somewhat of a trend that using that RS interval specifically um, does seem to be able to predict whether or not you have a good MI. As I mentioned, we are really trying to kind of fine tune this a little bit more, increase our, our numbers, because we only had four out of the group of 12 that did not have a good MI, which um, in, honest, in all honesty, I, I, I would like that to be a little bit less, but, um, but it kind of helps us uh, kind of confirm, is a change of 0.3 millivolts good enough to say, yes, we definitely are going to have a good MI. Um, but I'm going to leave you with this question, um, does time matter? So clinically, we know that the EKG will change from that hyperacute to acute into the more chronic, um, chronic time points. So in the hyperacute, this is literally seconds after we normally see that increase in the, the uh, T wave, right? And it really isn't until a minute or so that we start seeing that ST segment ele elevation. So all of our data that we looked at more recently is within that first minute. Um, and because we are trying to become more accurate and ensure that we have a good MIs every single time we go in and do the surgery, um, we, we, our question is, you know, is a minute good enough to say that that is the good time point to take the EKG and say, for sure, you are going to have a good MI as long as you have an increase of 0.3 millivolts. Um, and so we're now kind of looking at that, you know, within seconds of the MI, seconds of the ligation versus a couple minutes after, which time point is more accurate as far as the changes in the EKG. If you're looking within seconds, it may not be as accurate as if you look within a couple of minutes. Obviously, we don't want to take our animals out months later and look at the EKG, um, but we do want to ensure that our animals are getting good MIs every single time we go in to do the surgery. And so I want to uh, thank my lab, um, Miguel, who's actually uh, at the bottom right um, picture. He's the one who's been doing a lot of the uh, MI surgeries um, for the lab. Um, and he has learned it very quickly in only about a year. Um, and so he's been helping me try to find ways uh, to basically just ensure that we are doing good MIs every single time we go into and do these um, surgeries. And thank you. Oh, great. Oh, thank you, uh, Christine. So a couple questions rolled in uh, during your presentation. And uh, we will take the next 10-15 uh, minutes to uh, address uh, as many questions as we possibly can. So I encourage everyone to uh, submit your questions and we'll try to get to them during the last uh, during what's left of the presentation. If we cannot get to your question, uh, we will address them uh, after this presentation and send you guys the transcript. So to start off the Q&A, um, you mentioned CD8 T cells in the beginning of your presentation. Uh, would you say that uh, they're more beneficial than detrimental for post MI wound healing, or is it the other way around in your opinion? Uh, based on the survival and the echo data, I think that having them is probably more detrimental. But I mean, as I mentioned, it seems that they're playing uh, multiple roles and that may be because the CD8 T cells are heterogeneous. There's not, it's very, Hard to classify a CD8 T cell as just one thing. There's so many different variabilities, our memory, effector memory, all the different groups you can associate with T cells. And so we really want to kind of tease that down a little bit more. Is it that the memory are good and the effectors are bad or, um, and is it temporally different? Is it that they're good early but bad chronically? Because um, I do think that if we take it at a temporal time frame and look at every single day post a mile, their jobs are going to change. And so that's kind of what we're looking at now. Right, right. Um, does the, do you think the sex of the animal model make any difference in post-MI healing? Definitely. So in fact, uh, we had a study that was published in basic research in cardiology um, where we actually looked at immune cells in the post-MI wound healing process and we found that uh, neutrophils specifically were what we like to quote more efficient in the women or in the female animals um, at cleaning up necrotic debris. So they were able, able to uh, initiate resolution of inflammation a lot earlier because that necrotic debris was cleaned up. So yes, definitely. And that's something else that we really are interested in and we want to look at it more in more detail. That's very interesting. Uh, we have a, another question. Um, how long after the ligation are these measurements taken? 
So for our EKGs, we looked within that first minute. Mm -hmm. um, we, so we have a tendency of not uh, recording for very long. And that's actually something that I'm working with Miguel is like, let's try to record for five minutes and let's see, you know, if that first minute looks totally different than at the five minute mark. Um, but right now we're just now just starting to get that data. Uh, we got another question from Dr. Mary Lindsay, who I believe you worked with. <laughs> yes. um, she asked, do the EK EKG changes you measured correlate with infarct size by TTC staining, or is the EKG a binary yes, no infarction? Uh, that's a good question. So we are trying, we did try to do that with our data and right now it is not correlating with, with our TTC uh, staining. Um, we only had eight animals and they, the changes in the, uh, for example, the RS intervals were quite variable. Um, and so I'm not sure that we can actually correlate with infarct size right now. Okay. Uh, another question. Is the immediate time point most sensitive or can you use a 24 to 48 hour window? That's a good question. Um, based on the, what we know clinically, I, we know that the, as the wound initiates and you start having that change in, in the LV, that there are changes in the EKG. So I'm not really positive on that. We haven't even looked um, at the 24 hour and 48 hour time points to say, you know, those changes are better or, or as a confirmation of MI. We do see them on our echoes. Um, as far as when we take our echoes, we do see the uh, EKG measurements there, um, but we haven't quantified or anything like that at the longer time points. We usually just focus on those first, those first couple minutes. That, that makes sense. Um, what's your opinion on the best timing to get the best MI? I assume you mean by morning versus afternoon? I think so, yes. Okay, um, so uh, there's been lots of studies that look at uh, survival when you give an MI at the uh, early morning versus later in the afternoon and early morning, um, we have seen consistently uh, to be uh, better if you want uh, improved survival. So we tend to do all of our surgeries within the first uh, couple hours in the morning. Um, and after lunch, we try not to do any more after that. Um, so one of these questions is, um, how do you analyze the EKGs for MI? Is this automated? So I can answer that one. I know that uh, you're currently working with us to uh, uh, analyze your data, but because the, the system that you use collects it, um, and then in a sense, you can analyze it post either using a data acquisition system or, or, or another system like that. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so um, we've been working with y'all. Uh, we're using the iWork software. Um, obviously, there is a, a way to uh, kind of get some of those measurements as long as you can hook up the iWorks platform to your surgical board live. You can get some of those um, data live, um, but we haven't tried that yet. Mm -hmm. um, do you know if it's possible to analyze distal and proximal infarctions in the ECG? That's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure. That's a great question. <laughs> we can investigate for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also another question came on rat MIs and if this same system or process can be used on, on rats. So yes, actually in, our, in that picture that I had the mouse laid down, the green tape is actually covering the rat, pro, the rat um, sensors. Um, so that way we don't accidentally touch those during surgery and mess up the EKG. So um, yes, are those boards, the endos boards do have capability of doing the rats also. Uh, another question, and I'm not sure if you may know this area, but um, are there any changes in the ECG after occlusion when the thorax is closed? Um, I would assume pro probably not. I don't think that changing the uh, or closing the chest cavity would change the EKG, um, but we haven't really looked at that. Okay, this is the same um, attendee asks. So during my surgeries and after the ligation, the ST elevation is obvious, but after one minute, the ST elevation turns negative. Is this still an infarction? That's a great question. So. Um, as we're doing our temporal changes, we have found that with the 15 second mark and the one minute mark, 15 seconds seems to be more drastic as far as the change in the ST elevation, but by one minute it has gone down a little bit. Um, obviously, we're not really quite sure what that is due to right now. Um, but if, if we still uh, 
it's still not a normal EKG. So I, it, it's hard to say for sure without doing our timing studies, which we're working on now. But I, I think as long as you still see somewhat of an ST um, elevation that you could probably say, yeah, it's probably a good, a good MI. Confirmed. Yeah. Um, is there a difference in your opinion and different anesthesia for an EKG? So is there a difference in EKG dependent on the type of anesthesia used? Yeah, well, all we use is isoflurane. Isoflurane. Yeah. yeah, so I haven't tried. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not not sure. That's a good question, though. Any of the other cocktails? Uh, yeah. yeah, that that seems to be the most common, is the isoflurane. Um, another question is, um, what is the effect of strain of mice on the EKG changes with MI surgery? So there has been some studies that look at changes in EKG with different strains in uh, in in the animals. Um, I. I'm not well versed on that, honestly, um, but there has been some some publications out there that look at that. Um, I'm just not sure I can I can comment on it. Right. Um, would you know that um, if it's possible to see a difference in the ECG if other coronary arteries are occluded, for example, the circumflexes? Uh, so that's a good question. Um, I, I would assume yes. But I, again, we because we only occlude the LAD, um, and we have not really looked at that in, in a lot of detail. Um, I'm not really sure. Okay. Um, one, a couple other questions have been coming. It seems to be a very popular topic, <laughs> um, and I, I encourage you, Christina, as well, if you see any questions on the Q and A dialogue, dialogue box. But um, do you see the different changing of EKG on MIR and MI? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, to be honest. Um, I believe they're talking about perhaps, um, yes, I, I agree. Uh, MI rib perfusion and MI. So um, that study that I actually um, uh, had cited in my, in my presentation was looking at changes in EKG after uh, ischemia perfusion. So they, uh, that study, they looked at 30 minutes, one hour um, of ischemia, and then the perfusion process, and they did find changes. I mean, obviously, during the ischemia, you start seeing that ST elevation, um, and they did see changes in after reperfusion. Basically, uh, if I remember right, it's a T-way in inversion. Um, so there, it, there is changes. So you can still confirm that you have ischemia with the, with the uh, ischemia perfusion uh, surgery. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tim Hacker asked, do you see a change in polarity of the ECG, um, e.g. the QR waves flip from more upright to upside down? And what does this mean in terms of the myocardial infarction? That's a great question. So we do see it. It tends to be on lead three um, when it happens. Um, I have not looked as far as what exactly that is telling us based on the, um, on the MI surgery itself and whether or not... Uh, what, what it actually means, I haven't looked at, but we do actually do see it. And it, what's interesting is it tends to happen on, on lead three specifically, um, which is something interesting for sure. Is another question that you may have experienced, may not, depending on, the, I guess, the um, mouse model. Um, is it normal to have a 50 to 60% survival rate at day seven in C57 background mice? Um, so a, a lot of studies show a more closer probably to 60% survival rate. Um, and that, that study we did give fairly large infarcts. Um, obviously, we want to improve that survival. We don't want to give, this is one reason why I started looking at EKG changes and can we quantify them so that we can uh, basically improve our, 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 consist, our, make our infarcts consistent. Um, and uh, I kind of lost my train of thought now. <laughs> but but yes, I think that decreasing the infarct size would definitely improve our survival. But most publications that I've looked at in the C57 animals, their survival is going to be within that 60 to 65 percent by at day seven post MI. Right, right. And, that's and, then, and that should highlight that should be males and males specifically. Right. She does them. mention females as well being more right. successful. Right. Um, and then you mentioned sex, but are there age variabilities or changes in terms of the EKG phenotypes post MI? Um, so not that I have noticed and not that we have actually evaluated ourselves. Okay. Um, how long does it take to see dilation after ligation surgery? Uh, so, 
usually um, when we go in, it really depends on how large you give the infarct. Um, if you give a, a decent enough infarct, you can see start seeing a little bit of dilation as early as day one, day three. Um, usually by day three, you start to see the actual dilation. Um, but um, sometimes at day one, if you've given a very, very large one. <laughs> Um, and I know that you do use EKG to um, confirm, but uh, someone asked if you have any advice on better visual visualization uh, if you're going that method. Um, as far as being able to see all of the peaks? The, on uh, yeah, of LAD, yeah. So that actually is an issue that we run into a lot. We have, for whatever reason, one of our surgical stations has a lot, a lot more noise than the others. Um, and so I'm not sure I have any good advice on how to visually see the EKGs a little bit better um, because we have had that same issue and we were trying to kind of tease out why. Right. Um, do you have, um, or may, perhaps maybe not, but what do you think about the clinical translation of the transient LAD? ligation model, if you know so, that topic. I'm guessing you, they mean permanent occlusion. Yes. Okay, so um, because clinically um, about probably 80% of the patients get reperfused, um, it, there has been some concern that the permanent occlusion is not going to be as clinically relevant. However, there has been studies um, and a statement by AHA stating that the the permanent occlusion model is a really good model for heart failure, which is really what we're looking at. And that's that long-term um, remodeling process. In addition, because we look at the immune system, we want as robust of a inflammatory response as we can get, which is another reason why we tend to focus on the uh, permanent occlusion. Um, we would like to start going into the uh, ischemic reperfusion model uh, just to kind of confirm if what we're seeing is also true in that model. But, um, but that is a area of concern for, um, for people who use permanent occlusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like the questions keep on coming in. <laughs> uh, uh, can you see arrhythmias with the EKG during initial reperfusion in mice? We can actually. So sometimes we can actually see them. Um, it's not something that we look at in a lot of detail, um, but we, we have in a couple, a couple of times we can kind of see that happen. Um, and going back to age, um, do you have an ideal age range for survival? Uh, surgery survival in mice and for permanent occlusion specifically? So we tend to focus at three to six months of age. So these are the younger animals. Um, uh, however, I have been a part of other studies where we looked at very old mice as long as, as old as 36 months. Um, so we do, we have done that for our aging studies, um, but we tend to use a three to six month age range um, for, our, for our studies. Okay. Um, and then one last question, if, uh, um, did you have the chance to try some post MI care such as heating and oxygen delivery to increase survival rate or any other methods to increase your survival rate? So we actually do, we do. So we keep um, our, the indus boards are actually um, heated. So they're during surgery and throughout recovery, the animals are um, in either on a heating board or uh, sometimes uh, we put them in like a, a heating uh, not, I shouldn't say oven, but a heating area. Um, and so we also, before we take them off the oxygen, we, we look for things like, are they breathing on their own? Are they moving? So we will hook them up to the oxygen the whole time until they are actively moving and walking around. And obviously then we'll move them to a clean cage that ha is uh, on a heating pad so that they can kind of recover. And yes, definitely, that definitely will, uh, affect your survival on, on your animals as long as you take very good care of them during recovery and obviously keep them keep an eye on them um, for things like you know signs of, of pain or like they're not doing so well we right. also tend to give saline to our animals um, mm. uh, after surgery and that has also significantly improved our survival yeah i think everyone really wants to make sure that <laughs> that their animals survive and stay alive yeah, as long yes. as possible. Yes. Uh, it's a very popular topic and we have a lot of questions that are still coming in, but uh, looking at the time, uh, I will wrap it up and um, any questions that weren't answered, we will make sure to get to them and we'll ask Christine for some help on those as well. Um, so again, I'd like to thank you, Christine, for your wonderful presentation and uh, thank you for um, discussing, you know, the timeline of inflammation after permanent occlusion, your intro into your MI surgical model, model and using EKG uh, measurements to confirm before and after MI. Well, thank um, you.
No, of course, thank you. And so feel free, everyone, to um, visit our website at centica.com slash webinars for our upcoming webinars. We will be having webinars um, in the next couple of months. Uh, if you have any other questions about today's presentation, feel free to email us at info at centica.com. Thanks again, everyone, to for taking time out of your day to attend our session. And thanks again to Christine. We look forward to seeing you all at a future scientific Syntica instrumentation event. Everyone have a great day.